Thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Pete, for uh, being our guide tonight through a world uh, I'm afraid that we're sadly losing, the world of, uh, of these great newspapers. You don't have with the internet anymore is when that paper comes out and that front page is going to be on that newsstand all day long. And that had an impact back then. Now, because everything moves so quickly on the internet, you have a scoop and, you know, 35 other news outlets have it 30 seconds after you yeah. do. And you really have the sense in both of these movies, the climax is, this is our story, no one else's story, yeah. and we're going to own it that day, and we're going to watch all of our competitors scrap around the next day trying to match it the following day. But I think there's some of that still, as, as the internet professionalizes, Daily Beast gets a story, they want to own it for at least a couple of hours and, yeah. and make the other people react to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's still some of that. But you don't have that full day that we used to no, have. Remember, no, I mean, it was great when you had a no. front page. You just knew that was your story. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's sad to me, but it's, I understand it. You also see in both of these movies, because both of the papers are struggling papers. Yes. You see the family trying to sell the paper in Deadline USA, and you see this scrappy tabloid trying to hang on. And it occurred to me, since we have gone through this period, or are in this period of newspapers folding and in a lot of trouble, has this just been the way the profession has always been? <laughs> <laughs> when I started, there were seven dailies. And just a little before that, there were nine, because we also had the Brooklyn Eagle, right. which had a circulation of 300,000, mm. um, and the Bronx Home News. So even then, even though a lot of papers, the world and others, had died during, particularly in, during the Depression, um, we still had a lot of choices, and, and plus El Diario and some, some of the other foreign language, Noe Suia at the forward, et cetera, were all... Um, on those newsstands, uh, and uh, most of those are gone. Uh, so by the time, within the, a decade and a half, it was down to three, uh, with, a, with a, a New York version of Newsday added later. So Which the, folded in the mid-90s, that yeah, version. Yeah, and the price was... And what was it about the economics of newspapers that made it uh, <laughs> such a difficult business? Was it the unions and these things? No, I think most, it depended on the paper. In the, in the great heyday of the Daily News, for example, its daily circulation was two and a half million, yeah. you know, right after the war. Um, every time there was some kind of increase, circulation would go down. If the subway fare went to a quarter, you'd lose 90,000 papers because people uh, were on such tight budgets. There was not really television yet yeah. in that first 15, the first 10 years after the war, uh, competing for news. Um, so they had it to, their, to themselves, and they were not simply uh, breaking news things. They had uh, the comic strips to begin with, uh, and the, the tabloids had the greatest comic strips, uh, mm -hmm. Terry and the Pirates and Smiling Jack and all those. Um, but they also had all this other weird stuff, you know. Uh, the correct thing was something <laughs> they had in the Daily News. You know, that? it was like this. It was, and it was uh, uh, teaching manners to the to, the, to the lower class, like, don't pick your nose with a fork, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, but it was very weird stuff. The forward had stuff, too. Papers were, back in those days, uh, a paper was something that identified you. If you chose the Daily oh, News over the Post, you yeah. were a different kind of person from a Post reader. Can you give us a sense of the characters of some of these papers back then, and the type of person well, who would have picked them up? The post reader thought the Journal American was edited by uh, Franco, you know. <laughs> the, the Journal American reader thought the Post was edited by Stalin, you know. There were, <laughs> there were the different automatic cartoon versions of the papers, and, and most of the papers, they didn't balance the politics particularly, but they had enough in there. Um, 
to give the illusion that they were balancing it. William Buckley was in the Post when it was a liberal paper, yeah. Yeah. for example. Um, and there were some others, Marcus Childs. And the, but at the same time, there was Murray Kempton. It's like having Henry James in your paper. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was amazing the, the level that they were willing to go to, uh, whether people got it or not. They didn't write down to the paper to the audience. The audience didn't want to be written down to. Right. Because they were, I, I still think people who buy papers still are part of an aspiring class. Yeah. You know, they want their kids to get better educated than they are, or they were, mm -hmm. um, and move up. And there were other parts of it, essential to all of them, except the Times, which didn't have a very good sports section, was sports. So that when the Dodgers and Giants left in 1957, it hurt the newspapers. Mm. You know, when they left together, because the, the Giants were a Manhattan team and the Dodgers were a Brooklyn team, and a lot of the Brooklyn fans couldn't even think of rooting for the Yankees. It would be like becoming an Episcopalian or something. <laughs> you know, they, they, they couldn't do that. Ugh. So that was the rise of the Knicks yeah. and, and basketball because it was not um, some, one of the old traditional things that united people around the city. Is it also true, as uh, I think these movies show, that the papers back then were very strong because they were often edited and written by people who were the readers. You know, before fancy journalism school, before you went to Columbia Journalism School or Stanford, you became a newspaper guy, as I knew a lot of them from Daily News, who grew up reading the Daily News, yeah. and they went to work for it. So they had the pitch of their readers. Yeah. I, I never went to journalism school. Paul Sand, my editor, the executive editor of the paper, did finish high school, but he was unusual. Uh, there's one a line in it there somewhere where Glenn Close says, "You never finished college." <laughs> you know, most of the guys never. You know, the the older people in my generation had not been educated that way, um, and there were exceptions, of course. But I think more important, they lived in the city because they couldn't afford to go and live in the suburbs. They couldn't. Uh, in 1960, uh, 1960, the first year that I was there, I was making $108 a week, which con included a dollar a night uh, for working nights. It was called <laughs> night differential. So, <laughs> so it was more a bohemian trade than a, than a super professional trade, you right. know, and they, I thought that later when the Newspaper Guild finally got people paid enough what they should have been paid all along uh, and there was a move to the suburbs by people including editors mm. they weren't learning what you learn on the R train in the morning by osmosis just looking over shoulders to see what people are reading right. um, but also the sense of hanging around and talking to your local uh, fruit and vegetable dealer or whatever that right. came from living in town. So more people were living out of town except the young mm. people who were just starting out and who knows whether they... But it became, it became professional. Yeah, it became professional in that sense. It was professional before, but it was more a trade than a profession. Yeah. Mm. Um, and there were high, high, what I would call professional standards. Mm -hmm. And I, it's the one thing I worry about the internet, you know, that people work for nothing. Uh, to us, that's a hobby. That's not a profession. Yeah. You have to get paid. Yeah. And there should be editors.